Hört, hört. Festivals mit Ö1. Heute die Ars Electronica 2024. Welcome to the Ö1 Festival Podcast on the Ars Electronica 2024. From the 4th to the 8th of September, the Ars Electronica Festival in Linz will be showcasing several hundred projects in the fields of art, technology and society. An important part of the programme every year is the presentation of the Golden Nika Awards of the Pre-Ars Electronica, which this year once again honours works by artists from all over the world. The main prize in the New Animation Art category goes to the British conceptual artist, singer-songwriter and activist Beatty Wolf. Her interdisciplinary works bridge the physical and the digital. In 2019, Beatty Wolf was appointed a UN role model for innovation. Her visualization of 800,000 years of CO2 data was shown at the Nobel Prize Summit and the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow 2021. Her recent project, Smoke and Mirrors, which won the Pre Ars Electronica, picks up on the theme of climate change. It's about the rising concentration of methane in the Earth's atmosphere and the lies of the big oil industry. My colleague Hannah Balber met Beatty Wolf for a chat. You have prevailed among more than 1,000 submissions and received the award for your work, Smoke and Mirrors. How does that make you feel? Oh, Hannah, well, it's wonderful to be with you today. And receiving the Golden Nika is a tremendous honor particularly because this project came out just a few months ago, but really the week before my father died quite suddenly, um, which was completely devastating. And so a lot of the work around this project really, you know, came to a halt and I wasn't able to do much of anything really. So finding out that, you know, it had won this award, actually particularly because my father gave me the last suggestion about the project, you know, one thing that he might change um, in some of the wording. So it has a very special importance for me also because it connects with him. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm so sorry for your loss. Was your father a big influence in your life or also in your work? Did he encourage you to pursue your dreams? It's... Uh, quite hard to sum it up you know sometimes in a short answer but I would say he was both my greatest ally and encourager but also he could be my greatest antagonist you know obviously with love but he was incredibly discerning very critically minded and he always kind of pushed me to be better. And he was a, a dealer in science and natural history, rare science and natural history books. So I grew up with him having these, you know, Darwin, Ptolemy, Copernicus, Galileo texts in his flat because he couldn't afford a shop. I would say that his influence is completely interconnected with everything I've done because he was a, a scientist, but he was also a poet and a appreciator of the arts and culture and nature. And he is in everything that I do. When did you realize that you wanted to be an artist and a musician? I think for me, there wasn't a point that I remember thinking, this is what I'm going to do. It was something that happened so naturally when I was a kid, because... I loved storytelling and storytelling in all forms, whether that was putting on a play or writing a comic book strip or coming up with different characters or drawing or building these different worlds. That was very much from some of my earliest memories. And then also, you know, this component of science and these other fields, you know, obviously the ecology and the natural world and philosophy, you know, and, and through my mum, there were also other kind of disciplines I was interested in. And so I never really understood this idea of choosing just one thing. 
that you were going to pick one lane and just stay with that for how many years. I felt like, well, why wouldn't you be exploring art and science and ecology and technology and all of these different areas that were, to me, just like colors in a palette that actually brought more into the experience that you were creating. You studied English literature in London and also wrote your dissertation on Leonard Cohn. How did you, you said that for you, those different like fields or courses of study, science, technology, literature, music are interconnected, but you started out with one field that is literature and how did you go from that fairly classic course of study if I may say so to everything you have done in the field of digital art? Well I never saw education as being a primary focus. By the time I was getting my degree in literature I was working for a book magazine interviewing people and doing features. So I was already actually a journalist before I had a degree or any qualifications, which is kind of funny. I always loved writing. Writing for me was also something very natural. And I think that for me, literature, that this love of words, that was something I saw. It would enrich my music. It would enrich what I was writing. It would enrich communication and presenting different ideas. So I kind of just went with it, not really thinking, oh, this is going to be a entry point into another career that I wanted. I didn't want a career. I wasn't thinking job or career minded. I was very much just like, well, what could I study that might enhance some of these other worlds that I'm interested in? Beatty Wolf's work ends up going into unusual spaces. In 2018, for example, she beamed her music into space via the historic Hondel horn antenna, which was used to prove the validity of the Big Bang Theory. She presented her album Raw Space as the world's first 360-degree augmented reality live stream in 2017, playing in an anechoic chamber. The topic of environmental protection and climate change has been a recurring theme in her work for some time. The awakening moment for her was the climate documentary An Inconvenient Truth, which she saw in the cinema as a teenager in the early 2000s. Since then, it's been her mission to combine science and art, create access, make data and facts understandable and emotive. Her protest piece, From Red to Green, from 2020, deals with the CO2 values of the last 800,000 years, while the follow-up project, Smoke and Mirrors, published this year, deals with the increasing concentration of the greenhouse gas methane in the atmosphere. Smoke and Mirrors is based on NASA's blue marble photo and visualizes the rising methane concentration over the last six decades, with brown smoke emanating from the Earth's surface. Oh my heart, there's a sickness in this world keeps on spreading. At the same time, the video fades in advertising slogans and disinformation campaigns from major oil and gas companies since the 1970s. It also features BT Wolf's song Oh My Heart, which she released as the world's first bioplastic record in 2022. Smoke and Mirrors focuses on the other big greenhouse gas or powerful greenhouse gas, I should say, which is methane, which is, of course, a large contributor to climate warming. And you show, oh, yeah. show it, it in it this. Yeah. Sorry, but just to say, yeah, it traps, you know, 30 times more heat than carbon. It used to be more linked to agriculture, but it's becoming now increasingly linked to the fossil fuel industry, which is also why Smoke and Mirrors makes that pairing between the two. Um, but it also dissipates from the atmosphere quicker. So if we really wanted to turn the ship around, it would be very important to focus on methane levels. Mm -hmm. 
So you said, or can you clarify that again? Where does methane come from or who causes methane emissions globally? Well, methane is natural gas. So it comes from um, when we're burning gas and, you know, just warming our, heating our homes and things like that. But it also used to come from agriculture and it still comes from agriculture, but that was kind of the main component. And it was from, you know, cows farting. That's kind of the joke, is it was from so many cows that we have on this planet releasing natural gas. Um, but now with the fossil fuel industry, with every part of the process, you know, with extraction, with transportation, with leakages, that's where a lot of methane is now being released. This is one part of the work of the project, um, which is the smoke. The other part is the mirrors, of course. Mirrors are in this project claims that the big oil industry has made over the last decades. And why did you incorporate those? So why just not let the data, the methane data speak for itself? Oh, because with smoke and mirrors, it had to be methane and disinformation. Because in that 50 year period of, you know, when, say, the methane levels have really skyrocketed, that has been completely interconnected with the way that the big oil industry has denied the data, doubted the data, delayed the data. There is a playbook. It's called deny, delay, doubt. Those are the tactics that they use you know, that have now been, the tactics have been written about by Harvard academics and the like. So these are very well-known, employed tactics. And so that, it was. I felt it was almost the most important thing was actually for people to see these campaigns, like we're out to clean the air and your carbon footprint and, you know, apocalypse no, The lies they tell our children, in that sentence, the lies they tell our children is talking about scientists, the lies that scientists are telling our kids. And all of these unbelievable statements that are verbatim statements, they're direct quotations, you know, um, oil pumps life, don't risk our future, doomsday is cancelled. I mean, it's amazing. You can't make it up. And so for people to see that, it is really, really important and it's really powerful. What is the most shocking thing to you about those strategies, those headlines and advertisements? That it's not shocking, that actually this is going on all the time, that we don't even realize with so many systems, food, you know, politics, climate, lobbying, all of these, there's so much that we are unable to see as citizens and, you know, civilians that is all smoke and mirrors. Um, and so actually the most shocking thing was that it wasn't shocking. It was completely normal. Not normal, but it was completely predictable And in a way, obvious that this is what would be going on, you know, that greed drives the engine, that constant consumption, constant growth at the expense of everything else, at the expense of the finite resources that our planet has, at the expense of human lives, that money, <laughs> more money, more wealth, more growth those are the things that are prioritized in this incredibly short-termist thinking. So, yeah, I wasn't shocked by it, but I felt a responsibility to make it as visible as possible. This year's Oz Electronica Festival is dedicated to the theme Hope. So right now we're in the middle of a lot of global crises and struggles. So is hope something that you have right now or what gives you hope in today's world? I think I get a lot of hope and inspiration 
and energy from all the wonderful people that I know or that I know of who are doing, you know, incredible work and dedicating, you know, their lives to something beyond them and beyond their own, you know, self-interest. And I think also I'd say the main one is nature. Nature gives me hope every day because despite all of our insanity and all of our constant attack on nature, nature prevails. You know, I'm not saying that I know I can predict what will happen next, but I believe, you know, the natural world has far more intelligence, technology, resistance, unbelievable kind of problem solving capacities that human beings don't even know the beginning of. Um, And we as a human species may not be here that much longer. But nature is awesome. And we need to be supporting the natural world's incredible regenerative powers and actually incorporating those sorts of ideas into any kind of technology that we're developing and using. So your project Smoke and Mirrors will also be shown at Ars Electronica Festival in September. You can also watch it online. But what impact do you hope that it will have maybe also on the public perception on climate change? When I was at South by Southwest and I was presenting Smoke and Mirrors for the first time as a art piece I saw many people coming through and maybe they just saw a a brief 20 seconds or maybe they watched the whole thing and then watched it again and again but between those two ends of the spectrum both were able to really feel what it was about on an emotive almost unconscious level and that's what I think is important because right now We have so much information hitting us from every different place and it's all sitting in this same kind of superficial dimension, you know, where we have calendar alerts and social media and critical news and music and all of these different mediums because of the digital era that are essentially now just this same kind of frequency that is in the background always And so we are informationally bombarded. But when something really goes in deep and it changes us on a, on a fundamental level, it opens up something or it changes the way we think or it changes these micro decisions that we make, that's what's really important. And it's very hard to do that in this digital era. So I hope that the work continues to touch people on a deep level and hopefully maybe change some of their decisions or or some of the ways that they view the world and a lot of the time that's just simply because until we're aware of something it's very hard to know that we're unaware but as soon as we are aware it's impossible to go backwards. That was BT Wolf in the Ö1 Festival Guide to Ars Electronica 2024. Thank you very much for listening. In the next episode, Hanna Balber talks to Serbian scientist Vladan Jola. Together with researcher Kate Crawford, he's created a 24-meter-long map that sheds light on the complex intertwining of technology and power over the last 500 years. With Calculating Empires, Vlad Anjola and Kate Crawford have won the Starts Prize 2024, which the European Commission awards to innovative projects at the nexus of science, technology and the arts.